In this tutorial, we're going to cover static elasticity with gravitational body forces. We're going to consider the vertical cross section, the reverse fault. This is examples reverse 2D, where we have a rectangular domain that's 200 kilometers in the x direction and 100 kilometers in the y direction. Uh, in the set of examples that we'll be discussing in this tutorial, we won't worry about the splay fault and the fault. Instead, we'll be worrying about the deformation due to gravitational body forces throughout the entire rectangular domain. We'll cover the first four steps of this example. Steps five through seven are covered in the elasticity with prescribed slip tutorial. We're going to cover gravitational body forces and linear isotopic elasticity. Uh, this causes very large deformations, uh, and so a more a uh, realistic scenario is to have an initial reference stress, reference stress state that corresponds to the overburden pressure. Uh, so that get, allows us to um, have uh, zero deformation and gives us a good starting point. Uh, a more sophisticated way to get a good starting point for including gravitational body forces is to use an in linear isotropic incompressible elasticity so we won't get uh, the large deformation. Uh, and then finally, we'll round it out by covering uh, surface tractions that would be due to uh, loads uh, on the surface uh, using our linear isotropic linear elasticity. The topics we're going to cover in this tutorial are when are gravitational body forces necessary, how to apply them in this 2D example, how we can use reference stresses to balance the body forces, and then also using incompressible elasticity to achieve a good reference state. And then finally, we'll cover traction boundary conditions used to represent a surface load. When do we need to use gravitational body forces in uh, crustal deformation problems? Well, if the pressure or stress dependent rheology, if we have a pressure or stress dependent rheology, then we need to use them. Uh, these are generally are applicable to plasticity. Also, if we have uh, a stress dependent fault rheology, fault friction, uh, we often need to include gravitational body forces to get the proper uh, initial stress state. There are also viscoelastic simulations where we care about the vertical deformation and we need gravitational body forces and, and pretty much any other simulation where we care about the absolute stress state and want it to be consistent with the current geologic structure. The mesh we are going to use, uh, we built in our elasticity with prescribed SIP tutorial, so I won't cover it here. This is the output from DMesh, and so see that tutorial for uh, the details of how we created this mesh, uh, where we had fine resolution near the faults uh, coarsening away from there. For our cases of gravitational body forces, this mesh works uh, perfectly well. We could have done a more uniform mesh for just if we're just caring about gravitational body forces. The files used in these simulations, there is a readme file that gives a brief description of the various examples. We have our parameter files that end in .cfg. We have our generate gmesh Python script that was used to generate the mesh. Uh, we could also be using the qubit meshes, um, but in our examples here, we're going to focus just on the, using the mesh generated by gmesh. Uh, we have our spatial database files that end in spatial DB. We have a viz directory that contains a couple Python scripts for use with peer review. And then the output directory is where all the simulations will write their output. So let's consider step one. We're going to consider just gravitational body forces, roller boundary conditions, where our gravitational body forces are equal to the gravitational acceleration, which is uniform in the minus y direction, and our density. Our elasticity equation uh, now has the divergence of the stress as well as our gravitational body forces. We are going to use, have our solution field, which just has the displacement, and we have our roller boundary conditions. So quite straightforward uh, in terms of specifying what our solution field looks like. We can use the defaults, which is just the displacement. In this case, we're going to get a little fancier. Um, because we have gravitational body forces, we expect our stresses to be uh, linear, varying linearly with depth, which means our displacements should be second order. So we're going to increase our basis order for our displacement field to two uh, to accurately resolve that spatial variation in the stresses and displacements. 
and we'll use a quadrature order of two uh, so that we can accurately uh, integrate our basis functions. To add in gravitational field, all we have to do is within our problem, uh, say what the gravitational field is using this object. Uh, normally it is set to null and so um, it is not used. Then because we're in 2D, we have to set the direction of gravity to be in the minus Y direction. The default is for it to be in the minus Z direction. Um, and so next, our boundary conditions, roller boundary conditions, the same ones we used in our elasticity with prescribed slip example. We have Dirichlet time dependent boundary conditions on the minus X, plus X and minus Y boundaries. Uh, these are all zero displacement boundary conditions constraining the uh, degree of freedom, or the dis displacement component perpendicular to the boundary. So on our X positive, uh, we're constraining the degree of freedom zero. Uh, we have our label, label value for the boundary, and then uh, our, um, our Dirichlet values are uniform. So we use a basis order of zero. Those are all the same as what we've used before. Now let's look at step one in detail. We have our mesh file, our pilot app.cfg file, which we'll cover very briefly, our step zero one gravity file and our uh, elastic properties. So let's look at those. Uh, let's, so let's first look at our pilot. Yeah, that's the documentation. So we want reverse 2D pilot app. There we are. So we st at the top of the file, we have our metadata. We turn on a bunch of uh, informational journals. That's the information that's written to standard out. We look at a relatively high level. So we have our problem information. It's a time dependent problem solution. Our mesh reader, mesh IO Petsy, the materials, the displacement, the boundary conditions, the faults. Uh, which we're not using in, this, in our particular example here in step one, that's the options, our mesh. Again, we have our, we're going to use a nonlinear solver just to verify that our, uh, that this is a linear problem when we solve it in one iteration. Uh, the default quadrature order is going to be one, basis order is one. We'll switch those in the step uh, zero one gravity input file going to output over the domain as well as the top boundary shown here by Y positive. Uh, and this is the tag value used in the GMesh file. Our materials, all isotropic linear elastic. Um, all of them use this mat elastic under spatial underscore mat underscore elastic dot spatial DB spatial database file uniform properties will output the stresses uh, and, and using a linear basis. Um, boundary conditions are three Dirichlet boundary conditions, uh, all zero displacement boundary conditions, roller boundaries on the minus X, plus X, and minus Y. So let's focus more on our step one gravity example. Here we give the description, uh, more information about the keyword features, making it easier to find this when we search through things. Uh, the features we're using the gravity field uh, after specifying our metadata, we specify our output. So our output for our parameters, our progress information, and the defaults. This is the name of what our output files will start with. And then to uh, set up the gravity, all we do is create our gravity field, point it in the minus y direction, increase our basis order, and quadrature order to two. Uh, our mat elastic properties are shown here, uh, uniform uh, values. So we have a num one location, data dimension of zero. We provide density VS and VP, 2,500 kilograms per meters cubed, uh, three kilometers per second and 5.29 uh, kilometers per second. So that's it for our files. Now let's run the simulation. So here we are in the reverse 2D uh, directory, we can just run pilot step zero one. It takes a couple seconds for it to start up. Reads the final mesh, gives us the bounding box, runs through all the initialization. 
and it's during the solve converged in one iteration, which we expect with our LU preconditioner. And there we are. So scrolling back up, it shows a read the mesh in. We have the right domain bounding box. It's showing us all the initialization of the realities of the boundary conditions. Now verifying gives us the configuration, gives us we have our spatial, our scales for non-dimensionalization our solver parameters that it selected based on the problem type. So it's using the LU uh, preconditioner. We have our solver tolerances and solver settings. We're going to monitor the SNES. That's a nonlinear solver. And the time stepping uh, will trigger failures if nothing converges or it fails to get the right step. We have initial residual in the nonlinear solver of uh, 2.9 times 10 to the minus 1. After a single iteration, we reduce that down to uh, three times to the minus 13. So everything looks like it ran. Let's look at the results. So we loaded up our uh, pair of view here. We're going to do tools and, uh, sorry, view our Python shell. I'm going to make this window a little bit bigger. And this will initialize. There we have our Python shell. Run a script. We are going to run visualize using the displacement warp script. It'll load up. It ought to, the default is to load up uh, with um, the gravity domain. Our warp scale is too large. We have so much deformation. So I think we use a warp scale of five. Now we need to zoom in again. There we are. Let's get a 2D view and zoom in. And let me show the wireframe, uh, the pre of the undeformed configuration in a better color. Uh, let's show it in white. So there you can see the undeformed configuration. As expected, gravity just causes everything to settle down uniformly. We have no lateral density variations. So we have. Uh, 1.8 meters, I'm oh, sorry, 1.8 kilometers of vertical deformation. Obviously, this is uh, not, this is what happens when you turn on gravity from undeformed for such a large volume. Um, but uh, you generally, if you're setting up a simulation and you want to include gravitational body forces, you don't want to have this much deformation. So that's where our reference stress state comes in, and that's what we'll cover in our next example. So pretty simple for just simple gravity. Uh, if you uh, want to start from an undeformed configuration, now let's improve upon that. And so we'll go back to our slides. Here we are. There's our uh, deformed uh, state that we just saw in the pair view. Uh, now what we're going to do is we are going to incorporate the reference state. So here's our. Uh, now we've included a reference state uh, in our uh, governing equations. You can see that here is our displacement, same as step one. Our governing equation is the same. Um, only now what we're doing, going to do is for our materials, we're going to add in what the reference state is so that we're going to solve for the stress and strain relative to these reference values. We're going to get a reference strain of zero, but we're going to give a reference stress that is equal to the overburden uh, pressure. We'll show that in a second. Boundary conditions, same as step one. So we have the same input files, except we replace step zero one with step zero two. Here's what our reference stress looks like. Sigma XX, sigma YY, sigma ZZ is equal to the integral of uh, our body force, rho g. So that gives us rho g y. Uh, y being negative means that we're going to have compressive stress uh, on all three uh, equal components of stress. So let's look at our parameter files there. So now let's go to step two. Same metadata, just updated for our example. Uh, again, our output, just update the file names, gravity field, 
looks very much the same. Uh, but now our, for our materials, we need to say that the uh, database that it's going to use to populate the auxiliary field, that's where we have our parameters. We're going to change that. We're not changing the type. We're just going to change which file it's looking at, make sure that it uses a, a query type. So we have a linear variation uh, query for what that overburden is. And since the overburden pressure increases linearly with depth, this will give the analytical result at each quadrature point. Tell it that we have a reference state and to use those values. Um, we have a reference state of basis order of one because our uh, overburden pressure increases linearly with depth. So we want to accurately represent that. Reference strain we did, uh, is going to be uniformly zero. So we can use a basis order of zero, save a little bit on storage there, uh, and do the same thing for our crust and wedge materials. So let's look at our mat elastic reference state. Uh, there it is. So now, uh, in specifying what our spatial database, we have density, VS, VP, reference stress, the XX, YY, ZZ components, as well as XY, XX, uh, oh, sorry, XY. Then the, for the reference strain, we have XX, YY, ZZ, and XY. Uh, because we're using a plane strain assumption, you can have reference stresses uh, in the, uh, in the ZZ direction, ZZ component. So that's why we provide this, even though we're in 2D. We have our uni uh, units for each of those. We're gonna use Pascal's for our reference stresses. Strain does not have units, so we give it a value of none. And uh, num locations, we have a linear variation. So we just specify a variation at the surface and a variation at depth. Uh, so we have two locations, the data dimension of one. Uh, we're in 2D space. Uh, we'll use kilometers for the vertical. And so we go from minus uh, 100 to uh, zero, uh, uniform material properties. And then here you can see that at the base, we have sigma xx, sigma yy, sigma zz equal to minus 2.45 uh, gigapascals and zero for our strain. At the surface, uh, we are at a stress of zero. So row GZ for our vertical stress state. Um, and so we can run this example. So let's go ahead and run pilot step zero two, gravity reference state. Initial part of the output looks essentially the same as before. Solving the equation, converged. You'll see that it, uh, it converged. Uh, the initial valuation of the nonlinear residual is 10 to the minus 15. That's an indication that our reference state exactly matched the overburden pressure. And so our nonlinear solver converged without any of the linear solver iterations. And you'll see down here that it actually, you know, didn't use some of our linear solver options because it did not invoke the linear solver. So let's look at our output here. So now we need to update the name of the simulation. We'll say sim equals step zero two. And we were gravity ref state. Uh, and we'll say warp. Scale is five, that's just, so we won't have to update it, although we don't expect any deformation. There we are. And you'll see everything is black, zero on the scale. Everything is on this scale of 10 to minus 30, indicating zero values everywhere. Um, and this is what we expected. Our reference state exactly matches the overburden pressure from gravitational body forces. So this is one way where if you have a uniform domain, you can get an initial reference stress state analytically and use that as a starting point for your gravitational body forces as things be, um, to get started.
Uh, and the next step, we'll consider things if things are a little more complicated uh, and you need to go beyond uh, just an analytical, analytical solution or just a small perturbation from an analytical solution um, to get started. So we ran our simulation. There's the result we got. Now let's look at uh, step three, where we're now we're going to include incompressible elasticity. So this is uh, a formulation where the material is nearly incompressible. And so we don't expect deformation. And we can get uh, the overburden pressure. And we solve this in, in terms of incompressibility by having both our elasticity equation, where we look at the deviatoric stresses relative to a pressure field. And then we solve for the pressure independently. We have the divergence of the displacement plus the pressure over the uh, bulk modulus is equal to zero. As uh, our become incompressible, this term uh, becomes smaller and smaller, um, but it's also balanced uh, by the pressure. Um, so we, now we have to have uh, Pressure, we have, we have pressure in our solution, so we need to uh, prevent a null space, so we have to give it a value somewhere, so we say the pressure equals zero along the ground surface at the top, which is what we would expect um, in a problem like this. So there's our incompressibility formulation. You can see the details in the pilot manual. And so now let's look how this changes our simulation parameters. So we have, now we have two fields in our solution. We have the displacement as well as the pressure. So we need to change the solution uh, container from to include those. So it's a solution displacement pressure uh, object that we use to add in both displacement and pressure to our solution field. Uh, we give a basis order of one, we expect now to have very little deformation. So we can use a, uh, a smaller basis order than we had the large deformation and use the basis order of two. Our materials now, we use, uh, we change the governing equation for all of our, everything to be incompressible elasticity. And uh, then we'll end up with, when we do that, our default bulk rheology is the incompressible isotropic linear elasticity. So we don't have to actually set those values. And uh, then we need to update our material properties. Here I'm showing just the slab. And so it's matte elastic incompressible um, because now we'll have values that are consistent with the incompressible material. Uh, boundary conditions, here we show how to get a display, uh, sorry, a, yes, a Dirichlet boundary condition for pressure. Uh, in contrast to our dis uh, displacement Dirichlet boundary conditions, we add the boundary condition in the same way only, uh, and we use the same type. It's still a Dirichlet boundary condition. But now, instead of using the default field equal to a displacement, which is uh, a vector field, we use the pressure field. And uh, we still need to tell it that uh, the constrained degree of freedom is the first degree of freedom, zero. In this case, there's only one degree of freedom. Uh, on the boundary Y positive, we have the label and the label value corresponding to the physical tag name and physical tag value in our GMesh Python script. Zero for uh, the value of the pressure. So it's a, now we have a Dirichlet boundary condition for pressure on the plus Y. Uniform value, so we can use a basis order of zero to represent that. Input files, uh, same mesh, same uh, pilot app parameter file that's read by default. Uh, now we use step zero three and we have elastic and compressible elasticity uh, value. So let's look at our, uh, first we'll look at our step three file. We have our metadata. We have where we're writing output. This should now be relatively familiar with you. We have our parameters, progress monitor, as well as our problem defaults. Um, for the name, gravitational field, the same as what we've had before. We're going to keep our quadrature order of two, although we could reduce that to one. The big thing here is now we have displacement and pressure. So we need to update um, 
those values uh, go back to a basis order of one for both displacement and pressure. We have our incompressible elasticity, as I just showed in the previous slides. Give the, the file name for those. Uh, these values are uniform, so we don't care about whether it uses linear interpolation or the nearest value interpolation for the query type. Boundary conditions, we have our Dirichlet, boundary, Dirichlet uh, pressure field uh, boundary condition, as just showed in the previous slide. And we're, our data that we're going to output on that field is pressure. And moving over to what our material properties look like, here's our incompressible. Uh, so we're going to give uh, density Vs and Vp. So our density 2,500, uh, shear wave speed of three kilometers per second. But now for our P wave speed to be incompressible, we're going to give it a very large value of 1 times 10 to the 16th. So essentially incompressible. Um, and these properties are uniform. So we have one location data dimension of zero. So let's run this. And let's pull up our oops, my window here. So I list step zero three. Now we're in the solve. Start out with a residual of about five times 10 to the minus one. There it goes, converged in one iteration to three times 10 to the minus 13 using the LU preconditioner. And so let's look at the results of our problem. So we'll pull up. Uh, pair of you, plot the results. Need to update uh, our simulation. So now it's step zero three, gravity incompressible. Okay, we load it up. And so now you can see our displacements on the order of 10 to the minus 11. Uh, so just some very small variations yeah, related most likely to uh, the non-uniformity of the mesh. Uh, those aren't very interesting given the displacement magnitude of zero, but we can load up um, the pressure. So we can change this from displacement to look at pressure. And there when I switch, you can see that uh, our pressure in terms of surface with edges goes from zero to 2.5 times 10 to the ninth. Um, so the color scale is sort of flipped. The, the red is the high pressure down here at the base, to zero, and the blue up here at the top. Um, but you can see it created uh, basically a pressure that increased without any deformation due to the fact that we have an incompressible material. Now we'll move on to our final simulation. So there's the displacement that we had, 10 to minus 11. Now we're gonna move on to our final step, which is to look at a surface load and normal traction. So we're going to create a surface load that varies piecewise linearly on the ground surface. It's not quite symmetric over the middle of the domain. Basically it increases linearly up to some relatively uni uniform value for uh, over about 20 kilometers and then decreases. Uh, roller boundary conditions on the sides. Uh, so now we're back to just displacement, sing, simple elasticity. Now our boundary conditions, we have the roller boundary conditions on the three sides and our Neumann traction boundary condition, which is spatially variable on the top. And so uh, here we have the same as steps one and two, back to our displacement uh, solution field. The stresses uh, and materials are the same as steps one and two, linear isotropic uh, elasticity. Our boundary conditions, now we have 
uh, in addition to our roller boundary conditions, the Neumann boundary condition. So the Dirichlet boundary conditions were given in uh, the pile of app file. So in our step 04, all we have to add in is a, the Neumann time dependent boundary condition. Uh, it's on the Y positive boundary. Uh, it's uh, identified by the label and label value. We're going to use a simple spatial database because we have a linear variation in our tractions. Uh, we're going to put that information in traction surface load that spatial DB. Query type is linear because we have a piecewise linear variation. We use a basis order of one so you, we can accurately represent those uh, tractions. Our input files, we have our mesh file, our pile app file. Now we have our parameter specific to step four. We're going to again use our elastic properties so that we keep using that same spatial database. And now we add in our surface load spatial database. So we'll look at step four and our traction uh, spatial database. We'll load up uh, step four, surface loading. Here is our metadata, our output, specifying file names, displacement field, we can use just back to a basis order one. And for our boundary conditions, as I just showed in the previous slide, here we're setting the Neumann traction boundary condition uh, um, with a linear query type and given uh, in this file here. So essentially what I showed on the previous slide, now let's look at uh, what our traction looks like. So that was uh, traction underscore surface load. We have uh, we'll, we have to cover the entire uh, x coordinates of the domain. So we go from minus one hundred to one hundred um, in uh, my spatial database file. I extend beyond that. I go from minus one hundred and fifty to one hundred and fifty. So along x, we're going to put we're going to start at zero at minus 75, minus 50. We're going to increase it up to minus uh, compressive traction uh, normal to the boundary of minus 25 megapascals. Here's our what values are in the spatial database, the initial amplitude tangential and normal. Uh, given in megapascals, uh, we have a linear variation, so data dimension of one. We're in 2D. Continuing on from minus 50 to zero, we have our uniform normal traction of minus 25. Then we decrease linearly down to zero over 25 kilometers. And then for the rest of the domain, uh, we have a normal traction of zero. Uh, so we specified the whole boundary for our traction boundary condition. So we have our spatial database has to cover that whole range, even though uh, for a considerable portion of that domain, we're going to specify zero values. We could have defined our boundary condition over a smaller portion of the domain, and then our spatial database could have covered that smaller portion as well. Uh, we can run this simulation, just run pilot step 04. We'll get output very similar to what we've seen before with our uh, solver parameters uh, coming up, initialization, scales for non-dimensionalization, it's initializing the problem. It's spit out our solver parameters. There, they converge quite quickly uh, for this nice, simple surface load problem and linear elasticity. Uh, Nonlinear solver residual of ten to the minus fifteen. Let's go back to our uh, pair view, and we can solve this. Let's uh, now we're at step zero four. Surface load, we'll go back to a warp scale of a thousand. And so when we run our script, we can see what the deformation looks like. So there you, let's uh, change our color back to white so we can see the undeformed configuration better. Uh, and so there you can see that we have where we put the traction load. This is again exaggerated by a factor of a thousand. We have 30 meters um, based on our traction load of maximum offset. Uh, it's centered relatively uh, uh, symmetric about where we put the load. We do have our boundary conditions sort of close by. So we see some boundary conditions here where it's not quite symmetric. Uh, 
um, but pretty close. Um, but you can see uh, we've our surface load has uh, made us uh, substantial subsidence uh, in this portion. Greatest displacement there, roller boundary conditions, we have very little deformation at the bottom of the boundary. Um, and this boundary condition, this boundary, the X positive is sufficient far away, we have just a little bit of deformation over there. So just going through our input files, there we ran a simulation. There's where a deformation looks like. That's an exaggeration, I believe, of 500. And that concludes uh, this tutorial.